Welcome to today's broadcast on the basics of infrared thermography. I'm Matt Schwegler with the Infrared Training Center. Thanks for joining us. For today's session, uh, it's designed to be basic. So hopefully uh, for some of you who had some experience, this might be a little bit of a review. It's really for new thermographers who just want to get a taste of what's possible, what the technology can do. And then we'll cover some of the basic applications. We'll talk about condition monitoring, building systems, NDT. I think at the end, just wrap it up with some of the basics of IR training, why we have infrared training and why it's important. So we'll kind of do that. What are some of the big differences of infrared and visible light? Well, first off, if we're new to the technology, this is something that um, is tough to kind of, kind of grasp. We've got this situation. We've got this as a picture out in our lobby here in the, uh, the main office. And it's a visible light picture on the left. And we see a nice fall foliage scene in New England all these various colors of different colors of visible light. Well, that's what we see with our eyes. And so from a very young age, we're, we're used to seeing the world in, in a visible light spectrum. And that's where we're most accustomed to, and that's where we function best. But when you buy an infrared camera, uh, you're seeing things very differently from a very different perspective, a thermal perspective. And the world looks very different. On the right is that same photograph taken with an infrared camera. And gone are all the visible light colors. Instead, what we see are really patterns of heat. Brighter usually meaning warmer, darker meaning colder. And so the world looks very different thermally. And that's one of the biggest things that we have to make an adjustment as, as new thermographers, is this sort of switch from the visible light world to the um, thermal world. And this is just one example of many. But what I like to do here, what I'd like to start off with here in today's presentation, is just kind of introduce you to your thermal world. Show you some fairly common items that you might have in your house or in your everyday life uh, that you've encountered in the past and just show you how things look thermally. And then from that perspective, we'll kind of continue on and sort of give you an overview of where infrared is then utilized in a variety of different applications to diagnose a variety of different issues. But I think this is a very fascinating sort of transition that we have to make from the visible to the thermal world. And then we'll wrap it up with some overview of just, you know, why training is important. We talk about a lot of concepts in training about heat transfer, things like heat capacitance, conduction, convection, and radiation because these cameras see heat. It's the heat radiated by objects and everything that has a temperature gives off some amount of thermal ener energy. And so understanding this thermal world is essential to being successful as a thermographer. Take for, for example, something as simple as a turkey, right? You cook a turkey in an oven, you heat it up, the turkey gets warm, right? It cooks. And when it comes out of that oven, you might notice that the turkey does not cool off at the same rate. That is, the breast meat and the legs stay warmer longer than something uh, such as the wing. And there's a real thermal reason for that, and that's to do with heat capacitance. And this heat capacitance concept is something we talk about in our level one training classes. It's something that affects you as thermographers, that affects your ability to see things, uh, but also affects the thermal patterns on, on objects. And, and the reason being is that there's just simply less density in that wing. There's less moisture, uh, less heat capacitance. So things that have a lower heat capacitance uh, warm up very quickly, but also cool off very quickly. Things with a higher heat capacitance stay warmer longer. And this is how we can do things like a moisture inspection or look at levels in a tank or a vessel or a silo. For those of us that are new to thermography, you might not realize, again, the cameras, we don't see color. The color doesn't matter. Color is not something that affects us necessarily. Uh, we just see the heat radiated by objects. Color is a visible light concept. Uh, the flag here on the left, however, in direct sunshine does look different thermally because the sun does affect different colors differently uh, due to the broad spectrum of radiation coming from the sun heating up darker colors more than lighter colors. But inside, that same flag on the right, inside a house, shows no difference thermally because there's no difference in emissivity in long wave infrared based on color. Red, white, and blue all emit the same outside of that influence of the sun. And so we see a difference there. And this is another thing that can be difficult for us as new thermographers to some kind, sometimes wrap our head around that there's differences sometimes and yet other times there are not. Something such as snow and ice give off infrared radiation. Anything above absolute zero radiates some amount of heat. We're making snow here at a ski resort up north. And what we see here thermally looks pretty, pretty remarkable. You've got uh, warmer, brighter, darker, cooler, and the snow shows up as warm. Well, it's really only about 25 degrees Fahrenheit, but the thing is that we still see these patterns of heat, even with ice and snow. Things that are wet evaporate. I mean, that's how we know it's time to change the diaper, thermally. 
because we can see that evaporation showing up in this particular situation. Uh, but these patterns, again, that are invisible to the naked eye, will show up thermally in the right conditions. So these are, again, concepts of heat transfer that we talk about in level one, but just sort of an everyday type of example. Probably the biggest thing for thermographers that we encounter are issues with emissivity. Not all objects radiate heat the same. Emissivity is the efficiency with which an object can radiate that thermal energy. And why does the grill look so cold here? It's, well, it's really not. It's actually the same temperature. There's two spots here. On the right, where it's a flat black painted surface, it's over 300 degrees. On the left, shiny metal appears to be only 90 degrees. In reality, it's the same temperature as the spot on the right. We just don't see it thermally. It's because these cameras see the radiation coming from objects and that there's less energy being emitted from that shiny metal surface, it's going to appear to be cooler than it really is. And this is one of the biggest issues that we face with them as thermographers is that shiny metals do not radiate their heat signatures well at all. You know, with infrared, we can uh, we think of things like in television and the movies where IR is utilized to see through buildings, see through walls, and see through a variety of different things. Well, the reality is quite different. We can't see through most objects that we're looking at with an infrared camera, such as a window is not transmissive to infrared radiation, especially in long wavelengths. And so things that are visually transmissive suddenly become thermally opaque. Another thing that we need to understand is thermographers. And at the same time, that glass can also be a little bit reflective. And that will show up here on the right with my body heat reflecting off of that surface. And at the same time, we can see through things like smoke with infrared thermography. And that's why it's used in things like firefighting applications. Uh, that smoke is transmissive to infrared radiation, even though the visible light uh, is not. So things that, again, that we assume visually don't necessarily translate to the thermal. Even on a hot summer day, the sky is still quite cold. We can see that thermally here in this example. It's because we're really not looking at the temperature of the air. We don't see air with infrared. We're actually peering into outer space, and clear sky is actually really cold. So day or night, you've got cold with the sky here. And that obviously is something that can affect us if we're doing outdoor inspections. And we talk about this in our level one classes with a very cold thermal background that can affect the patterns that we see on a surface. And even then, the sky is not 100% transmissive. A clear sky will show different temperatures because as we look through a thicker bit of atmosphere, there is some attenuation of that radiation signal through the air. And so there is some absorption that does occur. And what we can see here over great distances is that the sky actually does have a little bit of a thermal signature as well. Um, but these are, again, sort of everyday life concepts that we look at with thermography and things that, you know, you're going to start to sort of notice and discover as you go through your thermal world. Resolution is a big thing that we talk about in our level one thermography training classes. How far away can we see with an infrared camera? Well, you really can see as far as you want. Just depends on the size of the object and the resolution of your particular thermal imager. In this case, we actually can see the moon and make out what appears to be a temperature off the surface of the moon. So distance is something that is a concern and resolution, obviously, depending on what type of camera you have, but uh, pretty unique here and pretty cool to look at. If you have a chance to do that, if you have a camera, definitely try that out at some point. We explore our thermal world all the time, all around us. We do training classes in a variety of different locations. This happened to be in a conference room at a hotel out in Las Vegas, a situation where they couldn't get the room to warm up, the air conditioning wouldn't shut off. Turns out the coffee pots were situated underneath the thermostat here on the left-hand image, causing that thermostat to think the room was much warmer than what it really is. Simply moving them fixed the situation. The air conditioning was then functioning more normally. just want to give everyone a taste of where this is applied. Now, this is by no means uh, a summary of everything. The infrared is used in, in a variety of different ways. But this is sort of some of the main focus areas that we talk about in our training classes. And for, for I think, where many of you are probably mostly going to be working potentially with this technology. Electrical is where IR cut its teeth, uh, really starting back in the 1960s, uh, looking for either hotspots, which could be a faulty um, a connection, a high resistance electrical uh, electrical connection like we're seeing here where it's hottest at the point of failure or an overload where it's actually warm throughout because it's either overloaded or there's a phase imbalance let's say infrared used very successfully uh, this is an example of an outdoor substation uh, showing a high resistance electrical connection on the upper left here this one on the right there uh, seeing a difference here thermally comparing these to the other two 
And what we find is that uh, IR is often a lot like Sesame Street, where you're basically tasked with finding which one of these things is not like the other. In this case, it stands out very, uh, uh, very much so, uh, very in a stark difference to the other two phases in this particular example. But it's also used on things like electric motors for the overall temperature of the motor, just make sure that motor is not exceeded its insulation rating uh, to check the temperature of that motor bearing. Uh, also looking at, if you can, the motor coupling, or such say the coupling itself, and then there's the motor junction box. So there's several different things that we can look at here with rotating equipment that can help us better diagnose uh, problems that we might be running into. Tanks, if you work for a large petrochemical facility, you've got tanks and a variety of different tanks, and perhaps the gauges aren't working properly uh, for whatever reason, or you're trying to locate sludge that's perhaps built up in these tanks. Infrared used very successfully in the right conditions to locate tank levels, but also the presence of sludge in these vessels as well. Valve operations on the lower right here. A valve that was in the open position. It was actually physically open. It visually confirmed it was open. But with infrared, we can see that the valve actually appears to be closed something that we can use infrared for very nicely, or possibly a leak or a bypass, let's say. Uh, belts, uh, belt drives and shivs and all this stuff, we can find things with issues uh, with belts. There could be a misalignment issue, could be a tensioning issue, but infrared will actually pull these out if you have good direct line of sight. It's not going to tell you if the belt is over-tensioned or under-tensioned necessarily, or if it's even a misalignment related problem but it does tell you that something is going on if you do see elevated temperatures on these belts. Uh, conveyor belts and then bearings. Uh, bearings are a big thing for infrared here. IR, not gonna say exactly what's happening. You know, the bearing could be, it could be a lubrication issue, could, you know, it could be some other faulty uh, part where the bearing is seized up, uh, but it does tell us, or at least leads us onto the fact that something is amiss that we need to look at and investigate more closely, something you're not gonna be able to do with the naked eye. This is a large rotary kiln. Could be at a cement plant uh, where these rotating furnaces as a refractory that's obviously in place to prevent the outer skin of this uh, vessel from failing. Uh, but if you have that refractory breaking down and you've got an increase in heat transfer, uh, the out sk outer skin starts to heat up. It starts to get soft. It could potentially bend or even uh, fail in its entirety. And that can become a very expensive, very costly problem. Uh, infrared can find us where we're having issues in refractories such as this or large furnaces or boilers or you name it. And then Rory, yeah, this is a situation you might be involved with, with building applications, whether it's summer or winter. IR is used very successfully to look at the building envelope for insulation related issues. In this case here on the left, in warm weather, we've got missing insulation or perhaps it's settled and we see a greater transfer of energy. The tops of the cavities are warmer, meaning we're getting, uh, gaining more heat into the building. On the right, we're losing more heat. More heat is leaving the building in a cold weather climate because of missing insulation in the top uh, halves of those cavities that we see there uh, on that wall. And again, in level one training, we talk about the conditions that are needed to look for these types of problems, the patterns that will show up, and the limitations of the technology as well. And even though I said earlier we can't see air with infrared, we can see the effects of air leakage, whether it's warm air infiltrating in on the left. This is through a vent in a sort of a warm weather climate uh, where we've got a bypass from the attic and a building being under negative pressure. Warmer air is coming in and washing into the house, washing into the room or on the right. In a cold weather situation where air is infiltrating in around a, a door here that doesn't have weather stripping properly installed, we can see the cold air cooling off the trim. And then for moisture applications, water that is intruded into a roof membrane because of a breach in that membrane, the water collects in the insulation underneath that membrane, it sits there, the sun then affects the temperature of the roof, heating it up, and as the roof cools off, areas of wet insulation tend to stay warmer longer into the evening hours. So IR is utilized as one of the diagnostic tools that can be uh, applied in building envelope work. In large industrial furnaces, we have a situation here where these furnace tubes, which could be carrying crude oil or perhaps water that we're turning into steam, these tubes can get 
uh, coated with a slag that will build up. This sort of uh, scaling that can happen on these surfaces can affect the efficiency of the furnace. Uh, coking on the inside of these tubes, again, also can affect the structural integrity of these uh, types of devices. And what can happen there is you can have catastrophic failures that can also occur. And so IR is utilized in this situation, a type of mid-wave thermal imaging system that can actually see through flame uh, to better diagnose these problems before they become big headaches. In the paper industry, this could be toilet paper or paper towels or newspaper, printing paper. Uh, the darker areas here represent potential moist areas that aren't drying properly. This is something where IR is used in more of a process control situation where if this was a product that we were manufacturing, that moisture can be uh, detrimental to the quality of that product. IR can then be used to make sure that things like the dryers are functioning correctly so that we don't have a loss in this situation. Same thing with maritime applications here. It could have a leak in the side of the hull of the boat and that leak because the boat either ran aground or bumped into something. Infrared is used to detect problems with boat hulls and maritime applications. And there's also gas detection as we see here. Most of which are mid-wave thermal imagers can actually detect a variety of different gases. In this case here, hydrocarbons like propane, hexane, butane, which don't show up visually, can't be seen with the naked eye, but thermally we can detect this due to the nature of the gas and how it responds thermally in a very specific mid-wave length of infrared. A great application here, optical gas imaging, that we in fact actually have another webinar available on uh, as well, which we'll show you here uh, in a moment. So why infrared training? Why get certified? Well, there are many reasons, but it's essential if you want to be successful with the technology. Properly trained and certified thermographers are competent thermographers. Uh, they do better work, get better results, and a better return on their investment in the technology. And that's what training really is. It's an investment. Uh, unfortunately, the emphasis on training is changing somewhat, and I think it's partially related to the cost of infrared equipment today. Uh, when I first started training thermographers back in 2002, most infrared cameras at the time were $40,000 to $60,000. Here's an example on the left of one such imager in that category. It's a FLIR P60. It was a significant investment uh, for many organizations who were using thermography, which they took very seriously. Uh, they took training seriously too, because if you're spending that much on equipment, you'd better know how to use it properly. It was shortly after that that the world's first sub $10,000 infrared camera made its debut, and it was a price point that changed the industry. And today you can buy an infrared camera that fits on your phone, such as the FLIR 1 seen here on the right, for just a few hundred dollars. Uh, plus the variety and quality of what's available for under $10,000 today is, is really astonishing. What hasn't changed during this time is physics. Heat still moves from hot to cold. However, 10 to 15 years ago, after spending $50,000 or more on an infrared camera, no one put too much thought into the additional cost of training, which was minimal by comparison. Today, however, with infrared cameras that cost less than some new smartphones, the perception of training has most certainly changed, with some thinking you can replace a four-day certification class with free YouTube videos or some kind of basic online operator course. You know, why should I spend several thousand dollars on a class when my camera only costs me 700 bucks? How does the cost of the equipment relate in any way to the training required to use it properly? We don't do this with anything else. An example I like to use here for my classes is take your typical hammer. You know, we all own one, and just like your low-cost infrared camera, it's pretty easy to operate. And like some infrared cameras today, it's also pretty inexpensive. However, it still requires a skilled carpenter to frame a house properly using the same tool. And if I hire someone to build an addition on my home, I honestly couldn't care less about how much they spend on their hammer. I'm very concerned, however, with their qualifications and the ability to swing one. That's not something you're going to learn and master by watching YouTube. The same is true with thermography. You know, I'm guessing the carpenter, the plumber, or the electrician working on the house has done a bit more prep than watch some free videos. I certainly hope so. Uh, so why would it be any different for a uh, thermographer? Proper training and certification is essential regardless of how much you may have paid for your infrared camera, and really it has nothing to do with the cost of it at all. Uh, and, and I really can't emphasize that enough, and that's why we have our certification classes, because you have to know what it is you're doing. You gotta know how to think, do things like focus. Properly adjusting focus is essential to getting great images with a thermal imager, whether you spent 400 bucks or, or $50,000. You know, without proper focus, it's hard to identify what it is we're in fact looking at. 
You might not realize, though, that improperly focused images also don't uh, reflect temperature values accurately as well. So we do a lot of, we emphasize a lot of good camera skills in our training classes, like how to properly focus and what you can do to get the best possible focus. Image adjustment is a big one as well. How do you properly adjust the images so you have the right contrast so that you can identify things like missing insulation? Because if you just rely on all the auto features of a particular inexpensive infrared camera and don't know how to maximize the contrast by making these adjustments after the fact, it's possible you're going to miss some critical thermal anomalies that are on the surfaces of things like a building here. So we emphasize good image quality in our training courses as well. Thermal reflections are a big one. False hot spots or false cold spots, things that cause an object to appear to be warmer or cooler than it really is. On the left, these electrical terminations look like they're warm. It's really nothing more than the reflection of the thermographer's body heat off of that surface. And as you move, you'll notice that the thermal patterns also change as well. But if you don't understand that, you're going to get yourself into trouble, where you're going to think that something appears to be a lot hotter than what it really is, and erroneously report it as an issue when it's really not. And emissivity is the big one here as well. This is a copper bus bar lab that we run in our level one training courses. Shiny metals don't emit their energy well at all. They're very inefficient in their ability to give off their true thermal signatures. And so what looks like only to be a five degree temperature difference on these two copper, bare copper metal surfaces, a five degree difference is really a 75, 80 degree difference. And whether you, again, have spent tens of thousands of dollars on a camera or only a few hundred dollars on a camera, it's the same issue. And that's my point, is that regardless of what type of equipment you own, training is really the essential component that sort of brings this all together. You can't just go buy a camera and start pointing and shooting and expect to get great results if you don't know what you're doing. In fact, you're likely going to get into a lot of trouble as well. And so we emphasize a lot of this in our level one, level two, and of course our level three training classes. Resolution is something we talk about as well. People are often are attracted to the low price point, the lower uh, cost thermal imagers because they're more affordable. Well, that affordability is also at a cost in the fact that you don't have as much resolution as per perhaps a higher end camera. And that could potentially cost you in your ability to be able to properly identify things like missing insulation or air leakage, or perhaps electrical problems that are occurring in an outdoor utility situation, in a substation, things like that. You might miss these problems because you don't have sufficient uh, resolution to be able to look at that problem. And then the misconception of that we can see through things. We can look through walls or look through metal panels. And that unfortunately is not true. This is a metal box lab that we use in our level one training classes. There's an incandescent light bulb on the inside. On the outside, it's only 114 degrees. And when you open up the box and look inside at the light bulb, you know it's over 320 degrees. And that 320 degrees is not showing up on the outside. And that's something, this indirect heating becomes very concerning and very problematic because in situations like this, presented at our information conference back in 2015 by Daryl Androli. This is a motor control center. This bucket with the door closed on the left, the hottest spot he saw on the outside was only about 91 degrees Fahrenheit, which is probably the ambient conditions of the environment in this particular mechanical room. Yet when he popped that open and looked at it directly, the hot spot on the inside of that MCC almost 874 degrees. And you could not see that on the outside surface on that metal cover. And so again, the untrained thermographer thinks that we can see through things easily, point and shoot, auto adjust, take an image, and what's the issue? How hard can it be? And the reality is, is it can be really hard, especially for those of you that don't know what you're doing as thermographers and haven't had formal training. So just a word of caution there, not trying to, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to get too, too far into it in this particular uh, webinar, but just to give you some examples of, of why training is important and having the knowledge really is really critical to being successful with this technology. All right, so let's wrap it up. 
Of course, all of our upcoming training dates and locations in the U.S. and Canada are posted online at infraredtraining.com slash schedule. For those of you in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, head to irtraining.eu for the latest list of classes in your region. Well, thanks again for attending today's session. We'll see you online again soon for our next tutorial from the Infrared Training Center.